Great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started and move the afternoon on just a bit. Um, I'm uh, Paul Underwood, a cardiologist that's here in Phoenix, and it's my pleasure to keep this discussion on amyloidosis going. I think it's been great the way that um, Sandish, uh, April, the steering committee, and certainly the, um, our, our uh, presenters have been able to lay out an approach to amyloidosis that involves pretty much all specialties, pretty, all the specialties that are involved here. We look very closely at the, uh, the pathology, the physiology, the treatments, and then some of the clinical presentations. And now I think we're going to go a look at a little bit more in depth on how we can actually identify some of these patients. And so these next sessions will be on how we identify the patients and what can we do to make sure that nah, none of the patients are falling through the net. Um, I'd first like to introduce Dr. Vikram Singh uh, from the College of Medicine in Tucson. Um, he's an internal medicine resident with the University of Arizona and College of Medicine in Tucson. So please come forward. It's, oh, excuse me, CMAR. No, no, no. Oh, excuse me. No, okay, well, no, no. So this is Dr. Excuse me, it's Dr. Seymour Singh. Right, who is, who is a medicine resident in the University of Arizona here. So thank you very much, and, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and it's an honor to be speaking here. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for the, uh, for the invitation. And uh, it's a privilege to be speaking right before my brother, Vic, who was in just introduced. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about clinical decision support. So what is that? Well, if you ask ChatGPT what this is, it'll give you something like this. And you know, I think we all hope that it would be something on the left, but it's probably right now something more like what's on the right. If you ask the government um, and the Office of Health Information Technology what CDS is, they would say it's a set of tools that are there to provide knowledge, person-specific information at the right time, at the right place. And they've really taken data from all these different sorts of uh, modalities and synthesized that for us to make better decisions in healthcare. To me, that sounds a lot like a resident. So, and if you ask ChatGPT what a resident on rounds looks like, this is, this is what it comes up with. So why do we need decision support in amyloidosis? Well, I think this has been extensively covered here. Um, you know, these, a lot of these signs and symptoms are nonspecific, and so physicians um, from a wide variety of backgrounds will end up seeing these patients. And that oftentimes, if they're not communicating, will delay the, the diagnosis tremendously. And we know that uh, delayed diagnosis of amyloidosis is incredibly uh, morbid. The mean diagnostic delay has been reported to be 39 months, and 42% of patients will actually not have a diagnosis even four years after, after uh, the onset of cardiac symptoms. So it's a significant challenge that we're all working to address. And the hope is that clinical decision support will eventually, with the help of newer technologies such as artificial intelligence, get patients on the, the diagnostic and therapeutic pathways much, much quicker. And so a, an example of, of, of how we can build small rules to help us make decisions is, you know, the Davies score, which we're all quite familiar with now. And so by looking at in the literature to see what we thought was associated with cardiac amyloidosis and then creating univariate regression models, piling that into a simple score, we can look and see um, that patients with heart failure who have a... Um, normal EF, you know, um, and a high risk should probably get a PYP scan and be sent down that, out, that diagnostic pathway. What I found interesting about this is that if you take that and apply it to the previous HEFPEF cohort, trial cohorts, you realize that there's a significant proportion of those patients probably were at very high risk for amyloid and we probably missed them. So if you take this one step further like Huda and colleagues did, um, they essentially mined the EHR and cl trial claims data, um, um, the, the claims databases, to identify ICD codes that were associated with, with, uh, with cardiac amyloid. 
And what they did was they created a, uh, they trained a machine learning model. So we'll talk a little bit about what machine learning is, but essentially they created a random forest model that would give, a, give you a prediction of whether or not these patients were at high risk or low risk for cardiac amyloid. And so what they found, um, and this is you know, something that actually Dr. Dave and, and our group has been looking at as well, is to really quantify what predictive comorbidities uh, um, are out there. And so for cardiac comorbidities, they, uh, they found atrial flutter, pericardial fusion, pericarditis, um, conduction defects, um, and abnormal ser serum enzymes are some of the strongest predictors of cardiac amyloidosis. For non-cardiac comorbidities, they found carpal tunnel syndrome, synovitis, and tenosynovitis are some of the strongest, and also ascites. All right, so what the same group ended up doing was trying to deploy this within the electronic health record. And so they actually had two publications where they, they um, presented um, its implementation in four large health systems, uh, I believe Cedars-Sinai, University of Utah, MedStar, and WashU, where some of this work originated from. And what they found was that, yes, we can, we can implement this system so we can use a machine learning algorithm that will fire and tell us when a uh, patient is at high risk for, for ATTR. And unfortunately, that's as far as they got. So they really didn't give us any summary statistics. They didn't tell us whether or not these alerts were actually valid. Were they false positives? Were they false neg negatives? So I think that's the type of work that really needs to be done, kind of validating some of these uh, machine learning models. Interestingly, so something that, uh, you know, we were thinking about recently was, you know, what if we become so reliant upon these, these alerts, though? Let's say it doesn't fire. Do we now have a lower suspicion that this patient does not have cardiac amyloidosis? Do we rub that from our, from our thought process? You know, that, those are some of the things I'd like to th start thinking about. And so I kind of transitioned into artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. So artificial intelligence, you know, this is a general term to really describe creating um, intelligence, human-like intelligence. And the amount of interest in artificial intelligence has not escaped cardiology, right? So just like every other field, we have an exponential rise in the number of publications that, that have been um, published actually in, in cardiology um, in, in the field of uh, artificial intelligence. And some of the terms that I think is, are important to think about is how artificial intelligence is kind of an umbrella term within which machine learning is a subset. So there we take data, uh, you know, very well curated data, and use it to train algorithms that can give us a result, uh, something important. Whereas deep learning is actually a subset within that where we can actually provide no a priori information and have a data set um, basically analyzed by, by the computer to give us some sort of um, output. Oftentimes this is a black box, we don't know what we're looking at. So how is this uh, implemented? So um, a group out of Mayo has created an algorithm, uh, a deep neural network, so this is deep learning, right? So they've provided, they've trained this data with almost 3,000 uh, EKG recordings um, of patients with and without um, cardiac amyloidosis. Now they use both light chain and ATTR, and they found that it actually has a very good sensitivity in predicting um, cardiac amyloidosis. In fact, 56% of the time they're able to have a diagnosis uh, um, with EKG before um, the actual um, clinical diagnosis is made. So what's also interesting, you know, we actually had um, um, this was actually effective on a single lead, so maybe someday this can be implemented in your, in your Apple Watch. And I won't talk much about imaging because Dr. Shaw did a great job this morning. So uh, I will say that, you know, integrating that sort of image analysis with clinical data is going to be very, very important. And I think that might be the future. So what are some of the challenges in AI application? Well, reproducibility and general, generalizability is very important. You know, a lot of us know how to read a clinical trial. You know, we know how to understand what a good trial is. Not a lot of us understand what makes a good AI uh, publication, what, what goes into that. You know, we did a systematic review of the AI literature and we found that, you know, only 25% reported ethnic information and 0% reported any 
any uh, socioeconomic information. So the external validity of some of these studies are you know, uh, quite uh, um, thrown into concern, actually. Um, and then, you know, very few actually externally validate 25%, and 55% have um, made the data available. Now, only 25% made the percent made the code available. So you see, uh, these models are only as good as their code. Um, they're only as good as their data. And so, without that, you know, it's very difficult to really analyze and interpret how effective they they really are. Um, so here's an AI-generated picture of cardiac amyloidosis. So. Thank you very much for your time.